Church. It is so good to be with you this morning. We are so excited about what God has for us today through the preaching of his word and the singing of his word together. I want to focus and turn your attention to the valuable truth that the treasure we have and our value is found in Christ. I'm going to read this morning from the scripture passage in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7. And you can join us right here on the screen. If you have your Bibles, I'll give you a second to turn to that. I once thought these things were valuable. He's talking about performances, pedigree, accomplishments. He continues, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. We're going to start this morning off by singing a song together as we meditate and turn our attention to the truth that our value is in Christ alone. Thank you. 
We're keeping this one. This is the retake. We are geared to pursue that which wastes away, that which is temporal. And if we're not careful, we will spend this life pursuing the things that really do not matter. We will want for our kids that which doesn't truly matter either. You are so greatly valued by God in Christ, not because of what you have or the things you've purchased, but because who you are and who you are as a believer is in Christ. You are who God says you are and you are worth what God says you are worth. God thought so highly of you and of me that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to purchase you, to die for you, to save you for all eternity. Let's listen to this next song together. It's called, My Worth is Not What I Own. It's a simple phrase, but the weight of it is powerful. Listen and worship and rest in this truth. My worth is not in what I own. Not in the strength of flesh and bone But in the costly wounds of love at the cross My worth is not in skill or name In win or lose, in pride or shame Stand away 
Amen. What a beautiful song and what a truth for us to rest in and to hold on to. Let me introduce this next video. The Contreras family wants to say hello and wants to warm our hearts as we miss you. We miss the, all the families at Redeemer. It's so nice to get to jump into their lives little by little in these short videos. Let's watch this together. Morgan, Reagan, Ethan, Elijah, and Stephen. We miss you guys. Hey guys, it's good to oh, see every. I mean, good to talk and to everyone. And Chloe. Oh, and Chloe. Forget about Chloe. So uh, we hope that everyone's having a good amount of family time and uh, just uh, relaxing during this time. Uh, so we'd like to go ahead and ask Ethan and Elijah a couple questions. And uh, here we go. So Elijah, what do you miss the most now that you're staying at home? All the time. Playing video games. Wait, miss? Miss. Yeah, what do you miss? Oh, um, my family and playing at the park. Your family and visiting with family and playing at the park. Ethan, what do you miss the most now that you're being at home all the time? Going to school and playing with my friends. Yeah, and then also you're missing a lot of soccer games too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also, Elijah, what is it that you like the most now that you're staying at home all the time? Playing video games and playing with Reagan. Playing with Reagan and video games. Ethan, what do you like the most that you're at home now all the time? Spending time with my family and playing video games. Yeah, spending time with your family and playing video games. We're doing a balance of both. <laughs> What are some uh, things God is teaching you during this time, Elijah? Uh, how to pray for countries and people. There you go. And how to stay safe from the coronavirus. Okay. Ethan, what do you feel God is teaching you during this time? He's teaching me how to pray and staying safe. All right. Reagan, what do you feel God is teaching you during this time? Elijah, Ethan's in front of Elijah. Yeah. <laughs> She's enjoying her all day time with Elijah and Ethan. Elijah and Ethan. So we miss you guys. Miss you guys. We hope that uh, we get to see everyone soon. And uh, it's great to fellowship with everybody on the uh, community group and see that uh, the message being uh, video cast. So, all right, guys. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. Now, we now want to get into the kids' lesson. So kids, gather around, and I want you to pay attention and focus, okay? This is for you. We value you also. We love you, and we want you to walk away this morning with this truth. God gave us his greatest treasure, Jesus Christ. And if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you believe in Jesus Christ, 
as your savior, you get that greatest gift. It is yours. But when things are given to us, Romans chapter 8 says that we, it is given to us to give it away to others, to your other friends. Let's read Romans chapter 8, verse 32 together. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God is not withholding anything from you, but has given you all things in Christ. There is no greater gift than Jesus Christ himself. God could not have given you anything better than his son, Jesus Christ. Sometimes we fall in love with the gifts, like maybe a bicycle or a toy or a game or a PlayStation, and we love those things. And those are good gifts from your parents but those are intended to point you to the best gift giver of all time. That is God, who has given you the best gift of all time, Jesus Christ. We want to sing a song together. It's, For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He gave us his son because he loves you and he believes you are valuable. Let's listen to this together. Wealthy man. This is Jesus. Hey, oh! Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. 
While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. One day, a crowd gathered around Jesus to hear him talk. The crowd was so big that people were stepping on each other. Hey, watch it! Jesus was talking to his disciples when someone called out from the crowd. Hey, Jesus! Teacher, tell my brother to divide with me the property our father left us. Ah, uh, hold on there. Jesus said, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Be careful and guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life is not measured by the many things he owns. Huh? Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Hmm. Ah, I got it. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. <laughs> now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> but God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. <laughs> Wait, what? Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. What a great lesson for all of us to remember and to be reminded. You know, we have a command in 1 Timothy. I want to read this together. Even for the parents in the room, this is a reminder that we desperately need today. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Amen. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. You know, the second point to our lesson this morning is what is the most precious thing that we can give away? You know, we have, we have been reminded that we are given this treasure in Jesus Christ. And if we have that treasure, the response to having that treasure is that we want to give it away. And the way we give it away is in good deeds and sharing the gospel and most importantly, in loving those around us. The second point this morning is that we get to give Jesus away. It is the greatest treasure. Why would we withhold the greatest treasure when we can give it away? and it doesn't cost us anything. We don't have any less of Jesus because we've given him away to friends and to those around us. We have more of Jesus. This next song is a reminder to us that we don't need to be afraid to give Jesus away. Last week's lesson is God, God watches over the smallest things perfectly, and we are super important to God. So much, though, that he has given us Christ, that we get to enjoy him today. We are to be givers, just like God gave his son to us. We are to give him away to the world around us, who is desperately looking for hope. You have that hope. Let's sing this song together, Giver, uh, Givers Like God.
Wow. What a lesson, not just for the children, which I know you enjoyed that, kids, but for us adults. How often we say with our mouth the truths, but we live with our lives the lies. We're going to sing this next song. It's All I Have is Christ. And though we'll sing that, I hope that the Holy Spirit brings to our minds the areas of our lives where we're not displaying that. We so quickly pursue everything else. Let's do this together this morning as, as we sing this next song, as we watch this next video. Let's declare that what we have in Christ is all we really need. And let's be thankful for that. In these difficult times and in certain times, people have lost much. Some people maybe watching this video this morning have lost, have, have experienced great loss in the last six weeks from loved ones to freedom to security. But we keep Christ. We haven't lost Christ. We get Christ. And if all we have is Christ, we win at the end of the day. Let's sing this together and let us find our hope and place our rest in Christ.
Good morning, Redeemer Church. I'm so excited to be with you today. Uh, Juan, thank you so much for leading the transitions, for helping us to focus on treasuring Christ and what it means and its implications. And I love the kids' lesson about when you treasure something then um, and you realize how lavish and good you have it, then it's easy for you to give away. And uh, that was really, really uh, good to hear. I think one of the things that uh, I want to kind of start off with today is just kind of give, getting you up to speed on some things that are going on in the church, um, where we're at, what the leadership is thinking, um, and where we're headed before I get into the message. And so um, we just met the elders the other day to think about reopening or when we, we would get back together as a church. And we took a look at different stuff from the national level, the state level, and the local level. And... Uh, are kind of going through that, trying to figure out what would be the best time. And we have a date that we kind of are proposing and we're gonna be meeting with uh, the ministry leads. So you'll be getting probably a text or a communication from Luis and we're gonna gather everyone together and we'll begin talking about like, when do we open and uh, how do we do that, right? How do we meet some of the guidelines? Um, there are some positives for us here at the at our church because we meet in such a large gym. It gives us, I think, more flexibility than others in, a, in maybe a smaller facility. And uh, so we'll take that into account. We'll talk about how to manage children if we're going to be doing that. I, I don't see us being able to do childcare if we reassemble. Um, and so just know that we're talking about it and we hope to be able to give an announcement about that soon. And... Um, you know, some churches are opening actually this week, and then I know there's other churches next week on the 10th, and so we'll get a good feedback from there. Um, the second phase that's coming for the state of Texas is March 18th. I thought it was March 14th, but it's March 18th, and we'll take that into consideration as well. And just so just so you know that we are walking through it, thinking through it, and um, going to do whatever we can to make the best decision uh, as a church. I will be posting a link um, for an article to all of our church family. It was given to me by a missionary, A.J. Gibson, and it was so good. Um, I posted on my personal Facebook, but I want to give it to everybody in the church because one of the things that highlighted in that article is that we're going to have people at various levels um, right, responding to the scenario that we're in. And so it kind of mentioned there are people that are more driven or concerned by, you know, the fear of this whole thing. Others are completely, you know, thinking that this is a massive overreach and things like that. And so what I loved about the article, no matter what spectrum you fall on, this is an amazing time to extend grace. Just extend grace to different families and different people because every person in every family will have a different scenario, right? You could have elderly ones in your home. You could have babies in your home. You could, you could um, not been personally affected by this in any, any way at all. And so um, I love the article because I'm excited about the opportunity to extend grace as a church body. So look out for that. It's on its way uh, very, very soon. Read that article and absorb it and let's just be on the front lines as a church of the people who give the most grace. And why should we do that? Because we've been given and are connected to the greatest grace that we could ever have received. And so because we've been given Christ, we can definitely extend that to other people. So that's all I wanted to just kind of get you up to date, knowing that we are talking about it. It is something that we've discussed and um, pray for us so we are able to make the best decision and at some point we have to reassemble as a church we know that is coming and uh, we just pray that it will be in god's perfect timing and we hope we can do the best job with that um open your bibles to acts chapter 4. Uh, i told you that we were breaking up acts chapter 4 into the section uh, that we were in into two parts and last week we talked about kind of jesus versus culture and now today we're going to talk about one of the harder things that we have to face as a Christian. One of the, the things that if you're listening right now and you are not a Christian, but more of a seeker or a skeptic, 
then this one is something that you're really going to enjoy because we're going to be addressing one of the, the biggest objections to Christianity. We're going to be dealing with one of the things that can be so difficult to talk about. And so go, let's go there, read the scripture, I'll pray, and then we'll jump right into it and uh, we'll, we'll see what God has for us. So we're going to begin in verse 8 of Acts chapter 4 and we'll read down through to verse 13. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, but there is no, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you would help me now, God, to continue what you are doing through this service. Thank you for everyone who's made this possible, God, from um, the multimedia team, Lord. I know Naomi has participated greatly in this service. I thank you for Juan. I thank you for the Contreras family, for Tara. God, there's so many people that are serving our people right now, and I, I'm thankful for that. But God, this is the time that we come to. We come to a time to submit and humble ourselves underneath your word. And so God, even though truths might be overwhelming for us or uncomfortable for us, would you give us a spirit of humility to receive your truth and to take it in and to let you be God. You call the shots. You set the course of our lives. And so we thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. And so today, I want to start off by making quite a uh, large statement. Um, I want to say to you that Christianity is one of the most humble, inclusive, and welcoming religions in all the world. Let me say that again. And some of you, maybe this is a, puts a bad taste in your mouth, but Christianity, I think, is one of the most humble, inclusive, and welcoming religions in all the world. You know... Um, it sounds pretty arrogant to make a statement like that. It sounds a little bit, um, you know, like something braggadocious. But I think if you will let me come back to this later on, I think the journey we're going to go on right now will help us to kind of walk through that statement about how Christianity is the most tolerant, humble um, religion in the world. It makes us uncomfortable making even a, a statement like that or hearing a statement like that. And here we are in a scenario where a statement just like that was kind of made. Um, what you have here is Peter and uh, John are before this, this kind of like council, this the, almost a senate, right, that would be like of today. And you have these parties questioning them and interrogating in them, interrogating them, and um, they make a huge response. And so the title of our sermon today is No Other Name. Because Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, speaks with crazy boldness. And one of the things he says, not only that, that they were responsible in a sense for rejecting Jesus and putting him to death, but he tells them that there is no other name under heaven where men may be saved. And that claim is what people call an exclusive claim. That statement is absolutely offensive in our culture today. And the reason I wanted to break up the sermon into two parts is because this is the stuff I love to talk about. I love thinking, meditating, contemplating on how to deal with objections to Christianity. Um, not because I like to win arguments, I just like to know how to help people and how to get them to see the preciousness, right? And the wonderful uh, person that Christ is. And so I love thinking about these things. 
See, the thing about what's going on here in this scene is if, is if Peter had said, Jesus is our way, there would be no problem at all. And you say, why not? Because of the context that they are in. This is a Roman culture. And one of the, the paramount markings of the Roman culture, you history buffs, is that they were a pluralistic society. And what that basically meant is that they were really good after kind of subduing you and getting you to fall in line to kind of letting your perspective of life, your view of life, um, be had, right? And so they were known for honoring religions. They were known for allowing different viewpoints and perspectives. And so here I want to just note for you that Christianity is born in this pluralistic society. Um, and this is where Christianity is birth and coming forth. And so today I want to kind of talk to you about this, dealing with this exclu exclusivity in a pluralistic society. And I want to kind of mention four things, if you don't mind. I want to talk about the problem, which is, we can all agree there's a problem here. There are two main objectives to, to this area uh, that Christians are going to get. And I'm going to talk about both of those objectives. And then lastly, I want to talk about a surprising solution. And so let's go on this journey together. What is the problem? I will tell you right now, the problem is exclusive truth, all right? Uh, that's the problem. Um, you know, a pluralist is someone who contends that no one religion or viewpoint or perspective can have all the truth, can have, you know, um, the, the basically all the knowledge. And so if I'm a pluralist, I'll just kind of be passive and say there's many ways or there's many alternatives and no one should really force their hand. No one should have an overly strong opinion, right? And so um, what's in, important, so interesting about a pluralist pr perspective, and you'll see this as we go on, is that there's something kind of underlying there, right? That's a problem. And that is if a pluralist says no way is right, there can be no uh, major perspective here except mine, the pluralist, right? And so uh, the pluralist gets to be on top of the mountain telling everybody how they should perceive life. And so but that, that, that's a, a problem um, because we as Christians, to be faithful Christians, are going to have to adhere to what Jesus says about himself. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. And so, if we're going to be faithful Christians, we would have to agree to that. And if we're going to be faithful witnesses, which is a big theme this year for us, is we want to grow in, in our passion to spread the gospel and proclaim Jesus to others. I cannot do that unless I declare this exclusive truth, right? And so that is our problem. Again, if Peter had said Jesus is our way, no issue. Because he said Jesus is the only way. Because there is no other name that caused a big problem. And so what a wonderful portion of scripture for you and me to walk through and understand how to deal with our problem. How are you going to speak to people about this exclu exclusive truth claim in a way that speaks to their heart. Now, that leads us, not only is the problem that it's an exclusive claim, uh, but it leads us to, I would say, two major objections. There's more, but through my reading and study over the years, and there's so many good books out there uh, on this, but I would say there's two main uh, objections. And I'm gonna kind of take a religious one and a more secular one so that you know how to respond to them, or at least you know how to think through them. And so one of the major objections that you get to Christians claiming this truth about Jesus is that they tell you, you cannot say that Jesus is the only way. All religions can be right. Now that's again, that's, a, that's an offshoot of pluralism, but I wanna say that this is more of a religious objection because um, they, the people who claim that there's just many paths to God and there's various routes to him and to each his own kind of thing um, are not really being honest with themselves. 
um, because all religions are not the same, I, I, not for a Christian perspective. And the way to, I think to think through this is to think about just who Jesus is. Like, who is he and what has he said? And so famously, right, C.S. Lewis has said, uh, you either are going to say that Jesus is crazy, right? He's, you know, nutso, that he is uh, a fool, or he is Lord, right? He's, he, he, there's no kind of middle ground when we're interacting with Jesus. Jesus made crazy claims. For sure, he claimed to be God. Uh, so when other religions say that he didn't, it's just like, that's exactly why they put him on the cross. But um, he said crazy things. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Really? Like, where were you? <laughs> what, what angle did you see that on? I mean, that is a crazy thing. Um, he said in other places, I've been sending prophets to you for years now, and you've been killing them. And these are just examples how our religion, Christianity, is not the same as other religions because of its founder, of, of, of who our Christian faith is built around. It's built around the Son of God. See, all other religions will always claim in some way to give you a pathway to God or to show you how to get a life that is pleasing to God. And so it doesn't matter which one you look at. Basically, the claim is, I'm a prophet, I'm here, and I'll show you the way. Um, I'm an enlightened person. Let me describe for you how to get to that place. But see, in Christianity, you don't have any of that. Uh, what you have here is God coming to find you, not you how to find God. And this is... When I deal with this objection with all religions can lead to the same conclusion, I say it's impossible for Christianity to ever agree with that because God has come for us. And if Jesus is God, then it will be, right, the superior way. Um, and so I know when we hear comments like that or phrases like that, you're like, child, this sounds so harsh to tell people these type of things that... Your religions are not right, and our, ours are. I just want you to, to know when I have conversations with people at times and I'm, I'm speaking to them about my faith in Christ and all of that, there can be moments, I think, in that where they kind of look at me a little bit, you know, with a, an odd look and say, what are you doing right now? Uh, I'm trying to convert you, right? Um, I'm, I'm trying to appeal to you about who God is and what he has done and how he has offered salvation for you in Christ Jesus. And so um, I think it's easier for me at times to witness. I got this from Matt Chandler. I thought it was so great. But because of what I do in my position uh, as a pastor, you know, when I get to meet new people, you know, it's very easy for me to say now, hey, listen, you know, I'm a pastor. You know that. So when would you like to get to it? And most people kind of know what I'm talking about because they know that I want to talk about their faith. I want to talk about, you know, their relationship to God. And so it, it, it makes people uncomfortable. But if Jesus is the Son of God, God come to find us. He made the way, right? He is the way for us. Then it is going to not be able to, we're not able to say that all religions are the same. And I know this sounds kind of narrow. I just want to give a response to you about this because in the past I've taught about apologetics and you know what? Uh, a lot of people just say, don't be overly strict, right? Don't, don't put hard lines in the sand. That's what makes everything uncomfortable. And I understand that, but I think one of the things that we need to realize is that facts um, are narrow in a sense, right? Reality is, a, in a sense, narrow. And I don't mean that in a narrow, in a sense of like, oh, it's, it, you're overly small. No, I mean like, you have to live by facts. If I decide to jump off of a five-story building because I feel like I want to fly today, the rule and reality of gravity will soon make an impact on me, right? And how narrow that gravity is going to show up and turn me into a pancake. It might feel like it's narrow, but it's just truth. Uh, I think a good illustration is, is, is 
you know, the way a plane has been designed, a, a plane has been designed. It's amazing to like sit in those big old airplanes, right? And to go like the engineering that's going on right now to take this massive amount of tonnage and lift it into the sky and bring it back down is an amazing thing. But if I had a pilot who came in and he said, listen, I'm a free bird. I, I, I don't like to live with restrictions. And I've been flying for 10 years now and I'm kind of done with it. I think today I'd like to flip the plane upside down and land this baby uh, you know, on the runway. It, it doesn't matter how narrow and frustrated he thinks the rules made by the designer to land the plane are, the truth is going to smack him soon in the face. And so um, it's important to note that when you feel uncomfortable about something kind of getting a little bit narrow, what's really important is not to say if this is narrow or broad, it's just, is it the truth, right? And I think Jesus tries to draw us into that when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so if, if Jesus is the truth, if he did resurrect from the grave, there's historical data about that. If, if Christianity has had this kind of impact over history and billions of people have trusted in him and seen their lives turned around, it's not an issue about narrowness. It's about reality. Um, and the fact is, without God, you and I are going to shrivel up. And we need God. And that's a fact. And this is a way to deal with this objection at times. The second objection is you cannot say that Jesus is the only way. Oh, no one likes this one. You cannot say Jesus is the only way because all religions are wrong. And so the objection here to an exclusive truth claim is more of a secular one. So if a religious objection is more like, hey, we're all equal here. The, the secular is like, all religion is wrong. And so this is a, a secular perspective. It's holding a very strong position to say something like that, of course. And I think the, the best illustration for this throughout the years, um, and a lot of secularists really love this illustration, is a famous one developed in the Hindu culture. And it talks about a blind man, some blind men, and an elephant. And the way they kind of described like what religion is like is that three blind men, one's grabbing a tusk and one's grabbing a leg and one's grabbing the tail. And they all are describing their religion according to their experience, but they're blind. So they don't get to see the whole elephant, right? And my one of my things that I challenge a secular person who says this is that they're really kind of pushing back on the fact that there can be no meta narrative, right? There can be no all encompassing position here. So everyone settle down and all religions are wrong because they're limited in their scope. They, they don't understand uh, the nature of life and blah, blah, blah. And so a missionary in India for years, his name is, let me look at here so I get his name for you. His name was Leslie Nugabin and he was a missionary in India. And this was the main thing that would always kind of he'd be approached by others about, and they would give this illustration. Then he realized that there's something happening in the story, which is very important, that is often overlooked. And this is what's going on. In this story, one person is assuming to have sight. Everybody else is blind. This is why all the other positions are wrong. But I am the onlooker on the outside, making the judgment call for everybody. Wow. What a superior perspective, right? And so I think, finally, I think he made such a, a solid point that when people try to say that all religions are wrong and uh, a secularist really wants to just kind of say like, they're, they're all blinded by religion. You'll hear that as well. And so the problem is, is that they have to adhere or admit to a position that they're saying is not possible. They're basically saying it is impossible to have a large, all-encompassing perspective, except mine. Do you see that? And so they're going to be inconsistent. And you can, you can tell that to them. You can share that with them. Like, listen, if you, if you think everybody has it wrong and you have it right, and you say no one's allowed to have this all-encompassing right perspective because you're a relativist, a pluralist, then you, you're not being consistent with your own position. And so... 
the fact of the matter is, if you challenge them, you'll find out pretty quickly that maybe they're more narrow than they realized. Um, and so this is an important thing. Who's open and who's narrow? And I think for me, you know, the way I've seen it before kind of work out, I'm just going to kind of lean towards maybe who thinks they're the most open-minded people. So you have somebody who's quite progressive, maybe quite liberal. You know, if we kind of stereotype them a little bit, they, they drive a Subaru, um, you know, coexist stickers and I recycle and all of that. Well, if we went to their neighborhood and I brought in my SUV with an NRA bumper sticker and I don't recycle, I eat animals or whatever, um, you would get some scowls, right? You would get iced out. You wouldn't be approached in a friendly manner. Why? Because we don't meet their cultural expectations and norms. And so even when someone says they're open-minded or claims to be open-minded, it's, it's a facade, right? Um, because even, even us as, as Christians, we, we have to be challenged ourselves. How open-minded are we about dealing with other people? And, right? and so that's where I'm headed to at, at the end here. I believe that Christianity is the most tolerant, humble, gentle religion there is in the world. And there's a reason for that, and we'll get to it. But when you're dealing with this objection, you cannot say that Jesus is only because all religions are wrong. The only way to get there, right, is to claim an exclusive position yourself. And so that's kind of, kind of how I tend to deal um, with that position with people. And so that kind of leads me to the solution. I need to move fast. We're, we're doing, uh, we're doing uh, communion today. So what's the solution, Chago? It is a problem. Exclusive truth claims, they're tough to deal with. I get these objections. There's many paths to God. All religion is wrong. So what's going on? I'm going to offer to you a really surprising solution. And I don't know whoever came up with this term, but I've seen it around for like 15 years. And it's called the most inclusive exclusivity truth ever. The most inclusive, exclusive truth ever. Uh, John Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. And in this book, he, he basically was looking at religion and how people interact with it. And he basically, basically said, humans are programmed to be self-righteous. Um, the fact of the matter, he concluded in the book, is that nobody holds a position in any life where they don't think they're right. So you can use religion, you can use a secularist, you can use anyone, right? The gamut. But everyone holds their position in a perspective of this is the right position or they wouldn't hold it, okay? So he says that humans are programmed to be self-righteous, but I love this. The really, the, the main key issue is how self-righteous are you? Since, since we're all programmed to be self-righteous, to find our identity and worth and perspectives and, you know, how self-righteous are you? Um, does your righteousness lead you to be condescending, arrogant, harsh, prideful, ugly? And that's the real question, isn't it? See, as Christians, we are the ones who should be the most gracious. As Christians, we are the ones that should be the most patient. As Christians, we should be the ones that are the most gentle. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that the gospel is on a mission to destroy self-righteousness. And so if we're hardwired for self-righteousness, which I agree, then the gospel is combating that self-righteousness. When I feel my significance is in my performance or my significance is in, in you know, the, way that I, uh, the way that I live my life or the disciplines I have, the gospel comes in and like attacks those. And so the Christian is the one who will claim very quickly that he is not better, smarter, more moral than anybody else. Actually, when, I, when people are really connected to the gospel and to grace, I have seen them agree that their neighbor's probably better than them. 
that person is probably better husband than I am. That person is probably a, a better leader than I am. That person is probably a better worker than I am. And Christians can acknowledge that kind of stuff when they're tapped in to the grace and to the gospel. Because we expect people to be better than us because we are awake, right, to our brokenness. We're awake to those type of things. And so what's a real key marker, now think about this, I think you're gonna really like this. The real key marker or the societal proof for me is let's lay all the views out. Secular, progressive, Hindu, Confucius, Islam, Christian, lay them all out. Now the real issue is who is the most tolerant, respectful, and humble? Out of all those viewpoints, who's the most tolerant, respectful, and humble? This is the key thing. Because the thing, the thing that will make this whole thing turn around will be a focus on attitude. See, if we are intact with the gospel and believe what it says about us and what it says about Christ, then you and I will be tolerable, right? We will be humble. We'll, we, we will be respectful. And, and we could d agree to disagree in an agreeable way. And so... A really great book on this is D.A. Carson's The Intolerance of Tolerance is really, really good. Um, Tim Keller's written a book, Age of Reason, as well, that does a good job here. And so, because Christians are the most in tap with the gospel and grace, then we are the ones that will have, I think in many ways, the best platform to proclaim and demonstrate these things. But... To kind of get more personal and help you to understand what I think is going on in the lives of Peter and John is this. There's a solution for you and for me to come to the place where we can be the most inclusive, exclusive uh, religion in the world. And my question for you is, what is your cornerstone? And you say, where are you going with that? Well, we saw in verse 10 that these people had rejected Christ who was the stone, the precious stone. And Peter claims he has now become the cornerstone. And what I'm talking about here is kind of like gospel identity. See, there's a gospel solution, I think, to make you and I the people that are gracious and humble. See, at the very bottom of every one of us is a bottom line, is a foundation, is what we build our life upon, right? our performance, our work, our successes. And some of us, you know, it's sad. Some of us build it on relationships, our children, how people treat us. You build your life on that. And when it gets threatened and, and there's something that goes against that, you and I can fall apart because it's built on such a poor foundation. But if Christ is the cornerstone, then there's basically a way that that will manifest itself. And so there's two basic ways of thinking about our self-image and about our our identity and the first one and it's really tied to the fact that everybody's self-righteous is that it's a moral performance narrative um, and you can be liberal or religious in this category see if you have a liberal mindset you will look down and feel superior to bigots rednecks and anyone who's traditional right so you're you have this performance mindset I'm educated I went to the right schools I fund the right things uh, I'm accepting of people, of, of gays, of whatever. And so these are badges of honor for you. And anyone who doesn't agree with your perspective on life, because it's moral performance mindset, you will look down on. Or you can actually be religious, y'all. You can have a religious mindset. And in the same category, you will look down at others and feel superior when people don't, don't obey. And they're not good citizens and they don't follow the rules and all that kind of stuff, right? And so you can feel superior as well because what you're hanging your identity on is your performance. But the gospel grace narrative, in contrast to the moral performance narrative, the gospel grace narrative says that you have failed, that you're a moral failure, that you have nothing to offer. And Jesus had to come and save you. Jesus had to come and rescue you. See, you don't even get to become a Christian unless you admit that you deserve hell and only by the free grace of God and by the sacrifice of Jesus do you get in, right? Like you don't get in because you think I'm good and I'm just gonna trust Jesus. It doesn't work that way. You have to realize that you were so lost you needed 
to be found, right? And so this gospel grace narrative changes everything. And the result of this living out of this narrative and tapping into this narrative is that you cannot feel morally superior to anyone. You cannot begin to think that you are better than. Um, the truth is I'm a sinner. I'm saved because I'm the worst man. And the grace narrative will take that superiority away. All right? And even if, like a good example of this being fleshed out in a pagan culture, in a pluralistic culture, was the, the New Testament church. Um, the Romans excluded all kinds of people. You're not from this class, this pedigree, this whatever. But Christians accepted everybody, right? It didn't matter where you came from, rich, poor. We see every gamut from society being saved in the book of Acts. Why? Because they had the most inclusive exclusivity out there. And so religion is going to tell us that the doers get in, right? Religion is going to tell us that people who perform and act and believe a certain way are in. But I love the gospel. It's so inclusive. Because if, if I really believe that only the good got in, too bad for the losers, right? Too bad for the broken. Too bad for the ones who had a bad start in life. Whatever. But the gospel says, no, you're a loser. You're broken. You're misguided. You get in. And so I want to declare with you, right, that this is uh, the best solution for you and for me when we think of this exclusive claim is that we have the most inclusive exclusivity out there. And so I know it's kind of scary to be talking about this topic because if you believe it, you might have to have conversations with people and share it. <laughs> and that's really scary. And some of us work in places where, oh, to claim Christ and to claim such an exclusive thing could really turn south for you. Um, and I know that. But I think over time, you're going to see as we go through the book of Acts, we're going to continue to grow in our boldness. Like our next sermon is in Acts is people praying for boldness. That's going to be good, right? You and I are going to get to learn how to pray for boldness. How do I talk to my cousin, my loved one, my coworker? How do I make this claim that Jesus is the only way? It is scary. And so we're going to watch a video right now. Uh, and this, we have a rhythm coming. I want to explain about it more next week, but... We want to kind of emphasize evangelism on the first Sunday of every month. And so we're going to watch a video about a Bible professor who talks to you about the fact that he agrees that it's really hard to share the gospel, that it can be difficult. And so I think you're going to really relate to that. We're going to watch that video. Then when we come back, we're going to partake in communion. And then we're going to close uh, at the very end with a declaration that we're going to add to our service. So enjoy the video and I'll see you in just a sec. In terms of dealing with fear and evangelism, I think the starting point is to realize that not all fear is bad. Uh, fear reminds us of the significance of the task of sharing the gospel. It's not something we should take lightly, and, and it also forces us to depend on the Lord. And in that case, fear can be a very helpful Thing. But most of the time when people talk about fear and evangelism, they're, they're talking about a fear that keeps them from sharing. Three common fears that, that I've observed. The first is not knowing enough. They're, they're afraid they're going to be asked a question that they can't answer. And I, pay, I tell people, you don't need to be afraid of that. That will happen. I have two master's degrees and a PhD in theology. And my own kids asked me questions that I couldn't answer. I would just stand up tall and clear my throat and say, go ask your mother. It's okay to say, I don't know the answer to a question, or let me research that and get back to you. Uh, a second common source of fear, people are afraid of the fear of failure. Uh, they're afraid that they might do more harm than good. But whenever I hear someone share that they're afraid they'll do more harm than good, I always think that's not your problem. They're a sensitive person. They're not going to come across like a bull in a china shop. It's the person that never gives sensitivity a second thought that may come across as aggressive. But when someone says, I'm afraid I'll do more harm than good, that's not their problem. They, they don't need sensitivity. They may need boldness. But I love Dr. Bill Bright's definition of evangelism. He said, successful witnessing is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results up to God. We can't change anyone's hearts. Successful witnessing is when we share the good news. 
I guess the greatest source of fear, if people were really honest, is fear of rejection. They're afraid, what will this person think about me if, if I identify with Christ? Uh, I think of the rulers that John talked about in, in John chapter 12, said many of the rulers believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees were not confessing him lest they be cast out of the temple. And then in John 12, 43, he gives this epitaph, for they love the approval of men more than the approval of God. But we have to confront that our fear of rejection is, is really loving the approval of men more than the approval of God. We, we need to love those who don't know Christ more than we love ourselves. In Acts chapter 4, we see that the disciples were afraid. They'd been threatened and they were afraid. And so what did they do? They prayed for boldness. I believe that's a prayer that God delights to answer. When we're afraid, we simply acknowledge that and say, God, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm scared right now. Would you fill me with boldness? That's a prayer that God loves to answer. Someone described it in this way. Fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and there was no one there. Thanks for watching Honest Answers. You can submit your questions by email, Twitter, or in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe to find out the answer to next Wednesday's question. Wasn't that great? Here's a man who is around the Bible all the time and he acknowledges how difficult it can be. And I think we just need to realize when we're talking about Christ and the gospel, we're talking about the most sobering things in all of life. And I'm praying that we all are going to grow in our evangelism boldness. I'm praying for that. And know that I sympathize with you as well. I'm not Mr. Bold. I got all the answers. I am not that kind of guy. Um, but I think we can learn together to rely on the Holy Spirit and to not be ashamed of proclaiming the name of Jesus. And there's no better way, I think, for us to really tap into the preciousness of Christ, the treasure that he is, than the gift of communion. So Jesus gave us a few things, right, a few commands, and one of the things that he gave us is the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to listen to a song right now. It's kind of like one of my favorite songs when it comes to thinking about communion. And in this song, um, I want you to, to grab your elements. Um, I'm just going to tell you they're a little bit awkward. There's two flaps on it, because you were given that in the care package, but the top flap you remove, and there's the bread portion, and then you remove the next one. Don't spill it, it, it can spill, be careful. Remove that, and so you guys can kind of get up, maybe you have them next to you right now. Go grab your communion items. We're gonna play a song that I absolutely love. Behold the Lamb of God. It's so, so good. There's a line there, it says, that I, that I wanna remind you of, and it says, um, and so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth. As we share in his suffering, we proclaim Christ will come again. And so enjoy the song and then we'll take the elements and then we're going to close uh, with a special ending. Savior Jesus Christ, 
precious song and a reminder that we are sharing and partaking in something so special right now and uh, we we didn't get to do this in February and uh, Don and I were talking about that that we just we long to remember the Lord's uh, death and shed blood and uh, and so we now are going to partake of this I'm going to read the scripture and then we'll partake of the bread and then I'll read the scripture and we'll partake of of his shed blood and then I'm going to pray for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Father God, I just thank you that today has been such a special day, God, that we had the opportunity as a church to see and sing about the treasure that is Jesus. And then, God, we go into your word and see how magnificent this treasure truly is, that he truly is the hope of all mankind. And instead of telling us what to do and how to do it, Jesus did it for us. Praise the Lord. And now all we have is the gift of grace. We receive that. We trust in that. We, we completely agree that Jesus on the cross died for our sins and that he was buried and now raised again, ascended into the heavens, standing at the right hand of the Father. And so we long, God, to see him again. Lord, I pray for our church to grow in their witness and boldness. I pray that you would help people deal with these difficult topics that we're dealing with. Help them to see Jesus, to run to him, to cling to him. And Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice of Christ. It's changed everything. It's changed me. It's changed so many people. And it will continue to change us, either until your return or till we are with you in heaven. And so, God, I love you and thank you in Christ's name. We're going to end our services in a unique way for the remainder of the year. We've been talking about this, and uh, I want to thank Josh Green for really helping us, and he's trying to take these initiatives and goals we have this year and, and bring them to the forefront and be able to really commit to them. And we have an evangelism series coming up about how to teach you stuff. And one of the things we want to begin doing is we want to begin ending our services uh, every week by declaring together the Great Commission. If the Great Commission is Jesus' command right at the end where he tells them to go and to uh, make disciples. And so um, I'm going to read it, and I would like you to read it at home. I'll read it slow, but I'd like to end it like that, and that will conclude our service today. So you ready? Uh, there's going to be stuff on the screen there, all right? And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'm excited to be doing that for the remainder of the year and growing in our witness and boldness as a church. And so I end with this. Now go be what you are. Be the church. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, 